For behold, all generations will call me blessed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Friends, there are two doctrines about the Virgin Mary that get people all worked up. Both of those doctrines that get people worked up were promulgated in or made official dogma of the Roman Catholic Church in the past 170 years. In 1854, Pope Pius IX made dogma the Immaculate Conception, the belief that Mary was conceived without the stain of original sin. And then in 1950, another Pope Pius, this one Pope Pius XII, made dogma for the Roman Catholic Church the Assumption of Mary, which is the belief that Mary was taken into heaven both body and soul. Now, these doctrines have become controversial and divisive because sometimes folks assume that these statements about Mary somehow erode away the powerful things that we say about Jesus Christ. For instance, if we say that Mary was preserved from the stain of original sin, then the argument is Jesus Christ did not die for all because all are not sinners. And because the Bible says nothing about the mother of our Lord after the moment of Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the concern is that the dogma of the assumption of Mary's death and her being taken into heaven is not biblical because the Bible is silent. And there is concern that both of these somehow diminish the uniqueness of Jesus Christ and his role alone is our mediator between a broken humanity and God the Father. Now, I think both of these can be addressed in a way that not only strengthens the witness of Holy Scripture, but I think we can also look at these in a way that protects and proclaims the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. And I would further argue, and the older I get, the more emphatic I become on this, and the more impatient I become on these arguments, I must confess, the more we think about, the deeper, the deeper we enter into the mystery of Mary's cooperation with the Holy Spirit and her union with her Son, the more, I argue, she actually points to and reveals about her son. In other words, to put a fine point on it, the more we think about Mary, the deeper we go into her cooperation with the Holy Spirit and her union and identification with her son, the more we will think about her son all the more. Or as one theologian said to John Henry Newman, you cannot love the mother of our Lord too much as long as you love her son all the more. The more we think about Mary, we will think about Jesus Christ because Mary is the shining example of what life in Christ actually is. She shows through her entire life the fulfillment of his promises and nothing that we say tonight and nothing that we can appropriately say about Mary can be said apart from the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. In fact, everything that we say about Mary flows from the work of her son on the cross. In Holy Scripture, she is uniquely aligned with Jesus Christ from beginning to end. Christ's victory on the cross is cosmic, able to stretch both backwards and forwards in time. And so she was, as an official Anglican communion document says, prepared by grace to be the mother of our Redeemer by whom she herself was redeemed. It was meet and right for Jesus Christ to use his mother as the icon for what redeemed life in him looks like. He prepared her to say yes to the Holy Spirit, and she was with him at every moment from his birth to his first miracle, to the cross, to the upper room, 
on the day of Pentecost. If you want to understand Mary in Holy Scripture, and if you want to understand the point that I'm trying to make, the first time we see Mary is at the Annunciation, when the Holy Spirit overshadows her. The last time we see Mary in Holy Scripture is in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes down again. Mary is the image of a life in full cooperation with the Holy Spirit. That, my friends, is supremely biblical. So if we talk about the Immaculate Conception and her freedom from the stain of sin, it's not that she was not in need of redemption, but in fact her son did redeem her, and her life now shows us what a life in full union with Christ looks like freed from that power of sin. And when we talk about the assumption like tonight, we are simply saying this, that at the end of a life that is in union with Jesus Christ, the end of that life is an eternity in union with Jesus Christ. And she shows us what freedom from sin looks like. She also shows us what resurrection looks like, all flowing from the fruits of her son's passion, death, and resurrection. She shows us from beginning to end what it looks like to be in full cooperation with the Holy Spirit and in union with Jesus Christ. And so I would argue all the controversial things about Mary at its core aren't controversial at all unless one thinks the promises of Jesus Christ are controversial, that in him we can be freed from the power of sin, that in him we can be joined with him for life everlasting. The Blessed Virgin Mary, as much as we love her and venerate her, she does not redeem us, but she shows us what redemption looks like in her Son. The Blessed Virgin Mary, as much as we love and venerate her, does not save us, but she prays for us because that is what the beloved in Christ do for one another. She is our mother in the sense that her example, her prayers, and her cooperation with Christ has given to us the promise of new life in her Son. So what does a life look like that is in complete union with Jesus Christ? Sing we of the Blessed Mother. What does an eternity look like for a life that is in complete union with Jesus Christ? Sing we of the Blessed Mother. Sing the chiefest joy of Mary when on earth her work was done and the Lord of all creation brought her to his heavenly home. Virgin Mother, Mary blessed, raised on high and crowned with grace, may your Son, the world's Redeemer, grant us all to see his face. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.